sorry guys we'll start in just 2 minutes so hello everyone i'm shraddha from project ask physios and thank you dr shwata and dr julie for taking out time for us on saturday morning to educate us about ongoing pandemic it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce you to dr shwata gore and julie koski so just a little introduction about our uh, uh, instructor dr shweta is currently working as an assistant professor at mgh institute of health professions boston massachusetts she is a certified lymphedema therapist as well a little about her uh, educational qualifications she uh, has done her bpt from the mgm medical college indore uh, madhya pradesh and uh, mpt from the manipal uh, university karnataka do do awaaz sunai de rahi hai karna she is a board certified uh, geriatric clinical specialist as well she has done her post professional doctorate in physical therapy um, from the university of michigan flint michigan and the doctor of philosophy from the university of michigan now let's know uh, about her professional achievements she has served as a lecturer in sanchiti college of physiotherapy at pune physical therapist at the narayan rehabilitation center the course instructor at the university of the michigan uh, flint and currently as i mentioned earlier she she is working as an assistant professor at the mgh uh, institute of health professionals she is dr she and dr uh, devashish tiwari has influenced my early professional life and um, we do look up to you thank you thank you for everything sir and ma'am now moving out to our second instructor for the uh, lecture for today that is dr julie koski she is from boston massachusetts and she is currently working as a coordinator of the clinical education at newton wellesley hospital and her primary area of the clinical practice is acute care with the special interest in the critical care uh, and start early uh, mobility she has worked with brigham and women's hospital on the cardiothoracic team she is a part of the front lines of the covid 19 pandemic in boston areas i would really love to thank you julie for uh, your care and concern towards the mankind in these difficult times and a little about her educational achievements now she is she has done her bs and msct from boston university 
and the doctorate from the Simmons University, Boston. I will be, uh, it will be so uh, great to hear from you both on this pandemic situation, your experiences and the challenges that you have faced during this time as a physiotherapist. And so now I request both of you to take ahead from here and enlighten us by your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Shraddha. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Shraddha, uh, it says that um, my sh uh, screen sharing has been disabled. Can you do it now? Good? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Julie and uh, Julie and I are here um, from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and we'll be talking about COVID-19 clinical implications. Um, so the way this webinar will run, I will talk about the background of COVID-19 and some pathophysiology around it. And then Julie will take over and talk about physical therapy aspects and clinical pearls regarding examination and management. So to give you some background about COVID-19, as we all already know, healthcare systems worldwide are currently focused on the management of COVID-19, which is a uh, disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. And if we look at the numbers, as of August 25th, 2020, uh, we have more than 23 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, and over 810,000 deaths across the world. And then in within United States itself, we have close to 3 million cases and 131,000 deaths. So the impact of this disease is huge and it's affecting um, everyone worldwide. And I know that the numbers in India are rapidly increasing as well. So what's interesting about this disease is the uh, disease severity. And so there is a wide spectrum of severity seen with this disease, um, ranging from mild symptoms to critical. So if you look at the mild symptoms, uh, patients in this category will have no shortness of breath. They'll have just constitutional flu-like symptoms, you know, maybe sore throat, mild fever, um, but no uh, drop in actual saturation levels. Uh, moderate symptoms uh, include uh, shortness of breath and saturation dwindles between 94 and 98, but doesn't really drop to dangerously low levels required. And uh, if there are um, radiological signs, there are like, very local um, consolidation areas, uh, nothing that would require um, hospital admission. And then moving on to severe category where patients do report of um, uh, shortness of breath, saturation levels drop down to nine, 93 or below. Patients do require supplemental oxygen. And we talk, when we talk about supplemental oxygen, it could range anywhere from, you know, just using, you know, face masks all the way up to non-invasive uh, ventilation like BiPAP or CPAP. And then um, is the critical category where patients definitely are in the intensive care and on the mechanical ventilation with respiratory failure. So the good news is that majority of the cases, more than 80% of the cases fall in that mild to moderate uh, in this category. And about 14% will develop severe Ill illness and require supplemental oxygen. And 5% of these will actually uh, develop respiratory failure requiring intensive care management. So uh, talking about the pathophysiology, uh, because this is primarily a acute respiratory syndrome virus, and it primarily attacks the respiratory system, uh, before uh, we move on to talking about the pathophysiology, I think it would be helpful to just re quickly review the normal structure. Um, so if you uh, see this, um, uh, this is the normal alveolus and air from the airways typically enters the alveolus. Here's 
So you have oxygen here and gas exchange will take place such, uh, such that oxygen from the alveolus will go into the capillaries and, ox and carbon dioxide from the capillaries will then move into the alveolus and finally get exhaled out. Um, so this alveoli, they are made up of type one and type two pneumocytes. And in, within the alveoli, we have something called as the surfactant. And the surfactant maintains the shape of the alveoli and um, prevents the alveoli from uh, collapsing. Now, if you look at the pulmonary capillaries, uh, they are, they're formed of endothelial cells. So if you look at the in, inner lining of the um, capillary is the vascular endothelium. And this vascular endothelial lining prevents things from inside to move outside, right? So it is like a protective layer which prevents um, material from uh, going out into the uh, space here. And this space between the alveoli and the capillary, this space is called the interstitial space. So now what happens with COVID, uh, the virus actually directly um, causes endothelial injury. So now because of the endothelial injury, um, uh, there will be a fluid that actually comes out from the capillary and sits into this interstitial space. So this interstitial space will now have fluid. And as the fluid goes into the interstitial space, it'll push the alveoli um, and make it smaller. So the alveoli will go, uh, go on becoming smaller. That's the first thing that happens. Uh, and that's called interstitial edema. The second thing that happens is that there is direct injury to the alveolar wall and the pneumocytes. And because of that, fluid starts actually entering into the alveoli. Because fluid enters the alveoli, there is dilution of the surfactant. And now, this, because there, the surfactant is diluted, the alveolar shape can no longer be maintained and alveoli tend to collapse. So when that happens, there's no actual air entering the alveoli. And so no actual gas exchange can happen. So no matter how much supplemental oxygen you provide externally, right? Even if you provide 100% oxygen, because that oxygen cannot enter and reach the level of the alveoli, gas exchange cannot happen. And that is called as refractory hypoxemia, meaning that hypoxemia that does not respond to external supplemental oxygen. Now, the other thing that happens because of this is um, hypoxemia causes a reflex pulmonary vasoconstriction. Constriction. So there is pulmonary uh, vessels, not just alveolar capillaries, but just large vessels, pulmonary vessels will all constrict. This results in pulmonary arterial hypertension, which can then lead to right heart failure. Um, and along with this, um, Another thing that has been seen in studies, post-mortem studies, is that there are thrombi that are formed in large vessels. And this large vessel thrombosis can lead to diffuse intravascular coagulation, resulting in multi-organ failure. So this is how it's actually affecting multiple organ systems. Now, uh, looking at the heart manifestations a little more in detail, so if you, uh, one of the things that we already discussed was that the hypoxemia results in pulmonary hypertension and that leads to right heart failure. The other thing that happens is that SARS virus itself can cause direct uh, injury to the myocardium, which results in acute coronary syndromes. And there is also, um, uh, hi a, a hyperinflammatory state noted in the body tissues, meaning that inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and interleukins are much high in these patients. And these inflammatory markers also cause direct injury to the heart. So all these three mechanisms or a combination of these three mechanisms result in um, injury to the heart uh, tissue. 
so in terms of lab findings, you'll see uh, ABG analysis will show signs of refractory hypoxemia in type one respiratory failure, where there will be uh, PaO2 values will be much lower. Initially, when the patients um, um, respond by increased respiratory rate, you'll see respiratory alkalosis. And then later on, this will change into acidic uh, acidosis uh, when carbon dioxide cannot, um, ex cannot be exhaled out. So you'll see like a mixed picture or a transitional picture where respiratory alkalosis then turns into acidosis. Uh, you'll also see the immune, immune responses will be lowered in the patients. So there will be lymphocytopenia and leukopenia seen with these patients. And as I already mentioned, there will be a rise in inflammation, so which will be evidenced by uh, high levels of C-reactive protein. Uh, in terms of chest X-ray findings, again, chest X-ray findings uh, will be diverse ranging from, depending on the severity of the disease, right? Uh, so it could just be a local consolidation, just one patch of consolidation, or there could be consolidation in the center surrounded by ground glass appearance, um, opacity, or there could be uh, the entire lung would show ground glass opacity. So something like this. So this is where you see diffuse, patchy consolidation, all over in all lobes of the lung, and that is ground glass appearance. Now, if at this level, this is critical, right? So this requires critical management. This is where the patient is already in ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. If the patient at this level is not able to, is not treated, or if the body's immunity is not able to fight the virus, then this diffuse picture will change into a white lung picture, which is you will not see any dark spots. It will be completely white. And at that stage, no oxygen uh, exchange can occur. So again, these are stages where uh, you would require critical respiratory management. And when we talk about respiratory management of this critical illness, uh, some, of the, some of the main stays include mechanical ventilation, right? So um, when would a person need mechanical ventilation? Um, as I, I mentioned before, refractory hypoxemia. So if the patient is, for example, on a CPAP or BiPAP machine with 100% oxygen, and you see that even with that, the oxygen levels are not improving, right? So even with, uh, then that indicates, you know, need for further intervention. So a need for mechanical ventilation. And the other criteria is where there is marked increase in work of breathing. Um, indicated by respiratory rates much higher than 35 or 40 breaths per minute. Now, with mechanical ventilation in this ARDS COVID type of uh, picture, uh, some of the um, um, unique features include uh, delivery of small tidal volumes. So because, this, because the alveoli and the lung is so stiff, because the alveoli are so stiff, when you try to push air in, there is too much resistance to open the alveoli. So if you, put, if you deliver two large tidal volumes, the resistance, the high resistance can actually rupture the alveoli completely. And so to avoid that barotrauma, it is important to just give really small volumes of air at, with each breath. The other important consideration is that these patients have very high work of breathing. And so it is important to reduce their work of breathing. Um, and in order to completely decrease their work of breathing, we have to rely on some dependent modes of ventilation like assist control or even higher. Now, the problem with these control modes is that in order to put the patient on these type of modes, um, uh, you have to completely sedate the patient or the patient will start fighting with the ventilator because, because the ventilator is like pushing air into uh, the patient. So sedation is like mandatory if you're using these type of modes. And then another thing that helps is PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, this really helps to keep the alveoli open at the end of expiration so that with each breath, there's not so much resistance to deliver uh, tidal volume airs, breaths. Another thing that has been practiced is prone positioning. 
So uh, conventionally, uh, prone positioning was or has been used in the treatment of patients with ARDS, those who are uh, intubated and mechanically ventilated. So there is good evidence on um, prone positioning to improve oxygenation in those patients who are already intubated and mechanically ventilated. And the reason why this works is because structurally, anatomically, we have more alveoli uh, located in the posterior uh, side as compared to the anterior side. And when you're in supine, the weight of the heart and the lungs compress the posterior alveoli. So when the patient is prone, um, these compressed alveoli actually now um, get uh, opened up, they get freed up and they can actually participate in gas exchange and you have more alveoli. So it's easy to deliver air uh, in the posterior alveoli. Now um, with COVID, um, more and more non-intubated patients who were spontaneously, spontaneously breathing were also uh, prone. Um, so recent uh, clinical, there was a clinical study that came out um, by Coppa et al. and Munshi et al. in 2020. And uh, both of these studies demonstrated significant improvement in oxygenation when the patient, when these patients who were not intubated were prone. But what they found was that as soon as these patients were put back in supine, the, uh, the improved oxygenation state, status did not last. So the sustenance of improvement did not last with, um, with the proning these patients. So at this time, there are many questions that are still unanswered and many clinical studies are needed to answer these questions on you know, uh, whether or not uh, patients who are spontaneously breathing and uh, non-intubated, whether or not they proning is effective. If it is effective, what, uh, whoa, who are these uh, patients? Who can be qualified for proning? What would be the dosage of proning? Like how long should they be prone to see a sus longer sustenance of effect? So these are the questions that have still not been answered at this point. Um, and then, so moving on to another treatment that has been used, and that is extracorporeal membrane uh, oxygenation, ECMO. Um, so why ECMO? ECMO actually provides uh, support to both the heart and the lungs. And so it gives the patients time, like the patients don't have to do any work at all. So the, it gives time for the body to fight the virus. And why in COVID? In COVID, because as we already saw, uh, it is not just the lungs that are affected, it is also the heart that is affected. So um, ECMO can uh, really relieve both the heart and the lungs by acting as the patient's heart and lung. So what, uh, what happens with ECMO is that there is a tube that is connected from the heart, uh, which, will, uh, carry, um, which will carry the deoxygenated blood from vena cavas into the ECMO, and then there is a artificial oxygenator or artificial lung, which will purify this air, meaning that it will oxygenate the air. And then this oxygenated air is pushed into another mechanical pump, which is the artificial heart. And then this mechanical pump will push the oxygenated air into different areas of the, of the body. So really the heart and the lung of the person is not, not working at all. Uh, other experimental uh, treatments that have uh, that are uh, in clinical trials right now include plasma therapy and immune uh, immune immunoglobulin therapy, inhaled nitric oxide therapy, and ex uh, delivery of exo exogenous surfactants. Um, so then, moving on to the long-term consequences, as more and more patients are now being discharged from acute care, we're seeing that these patients are also developing some long-term consequences. Um, these include reduced; they they're definitely deconditioned because they're spending a lot of time in the hospitals, so they're deconditioned. Their exercise capacity is really, really low. Some patients are developing lung fibrosis, so some, um, th which is a chronic condition. At this point, interstitial fibrosis does not have uh, good, um, you know, medical management. 
except for like pulmonary rehab, which has shown some promising effects. Uh, neuromuscular uh, long-term uh, consequences include persistent headaches. So patients are complaining of persistent head headaches, loss of taste and loss of smell have shown to be persistent uh, after COVID. And then um, some patients are developing stroke and other vascular events, memory and executive function deficits, and what's very commonly seen is critical illness-related myopathy and neuropathy, um, known as CRIMNI, and persistent dysphagias, persistent joint stiffness, and pain. So as, we, as more and more individuals with COVID-19, as we see that these patients are surviving, and as we see that these patients get discharged from the hospital, we'll see that these patients will develop all these long-term consequences uh, which have direct implications to PT. Um, so as physical therapists, as part of the rehab team, we are now at this position where we need some questions answered, right? So we need to know what are some kinds of assessments uh, that should be prioritized with these patients? Are there certain outcome measures that need to be developed um, for these specific COVID-19 survivors? Um, interventions, you know, what type of interventions need to be prioritized with these, patient, these specific patients? So um, our team here at MGH, IHP, uh, Simmons and Emerson Hospital, uh, we've done some preliminary work on uh, just exploring uh, patterns of um, physical therapy exam and intervention across different settings. But um, a lot more uh, work needs to be done. There's a lot of research that needs to happen in this area, um, which is also exciting because that's like a lot of research opportunities have opened up. Um, and then finally, you know, um, I know a lot of rumors are and fake news have been floated around in social media and WhatsApp. So uh, World Health Organization actually did a wonderful job of coming up with some myth busters and they have a long list, a much longer list than what I have here. So you can actually go onto the site and uh, check those out. It's really nice. Um, so some of these are that uh, chloroquine does not really, uh, is, uh, uh, does not really reduce deaths. It actually was not found to be effective in fighting coronavirus. So no point in hoarding that, right? Uh, people of all ages can be infected with COVID-19. So earlier it was thought that it was only older adults, those who have more uh, comorbidities are more susceptible to this virus. However, um, it's seen now that more and more younger individuals, even who don't have any comorbidities are getting, uh, getting the disease. Uh, prolonged use of medical masks does not lead to CO2 intoxication or oxygen deficiency. Drinking alcohol does not protect you against COVID-19. Adding pepper, turmeric, ginger, garlic does not to food does not prevent COVID-19. COVID-19 is not transmitted through house flies. Exposing yourself to higher temperatures does not protect you from COVID-19. And um, this is still unclear. So the only way to be, uh, beat uh, COVID-19 is herd immunity. This was thought that this is the only option right now. However, because this virus is mutating at such a fast rate uh, every day, these mutations actually limit the ability and question the ability of herd immunity in fighting the virus. Um, you can still take ibuprofen if you have COVID-19. So again, ibuprofen was not found to be really effective in, uh, I mean, whatever those uh, rumors were, were not really found uh, to be uh, true. Uh, and then finally, wearing a mask, I should add, and practicing social distancing is are the most inexpensive ways to reduce the spread of the virus. Uh, so with that, I will um, uh, transfer this floor to Julie, who will take it from here and talk about the PT management. Thank you. I will attempt to share my screen. Give me a 
Let's see here. Okay. You guys see it? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Um, we'll go back to the beginning. So um, I hope to pick up on a lot of what Shweta was saying about um, how it actually happens in the hospital. And probably I'll be talking a little bit more about that 5% that she was speaking about that end up actually on mechanical ventilation, uh, because that is my primary area of practice. And those people that end up in the hospital and end up on mechanical ventilation would be the minority, but certainly um, a high risk population and certainly a risk, uh, a population where physical therapy is really important and very rewarding. So that's the focus of mine, the more the clinical perspective um, of what it's like to practice in the Boston area. So this is the hospital that I work at. It's, um, it's a community hospital. We are the sister hospital of Mass General. So we do have a lot of um, rotating residents and doctors from that area. And we're part of a larger hospital system um, that also includes the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Our normal um, ICU bed population is 12. Uh, but during the COVID surge, we were required to ramp that up to um, uh, 24 beds. And we need to maintain that ability to keep 24 beds um, open in case of another surge. So it was wild to do that. So I'll give you a little background of what we normally only have about 14 physical therapists and three PT assistants. Um, we uh, certainly with a surge and adding different units, we had um, a, lot, a lot more work to do, but different type of work to do. So we were uh, joined by 12 outpatient physical therapists who had to come in um, and treat inpatients, which in this country is not usual that you would share that kind of uh, role to be inpatient and outpatient. So you can understand that there was a lot of um, anxiety and uncertainty about not only um, having to treat inpatients, but also in a pandemic. So it was quite a situation to have uh, 12 colleagues join us um, and treating alongside us for the for this pandemic. But um, one of the silver linings of the of the COVID pandemic for us has been um, meeting people from all different um, groups within the hospital, including our own colleagues, just from different departments and a, a really true team atmosphere. So that has been has been really fun and one of those things that I'll always remember. Um, so we really had to transform our service. We went from having maybe 70 people on our caseload to um, having maybe 20. And those were for PT patients that needed help. So we had to split into three groups. One was consults, which were the usual patients coming in with pneumonia, um, stroke, heart attack, that kind of thing. Uh, and that was a day, daytime service as usual, but very, very low census. The people who needed care really went into hiding in, in a very real way. And we're starting to see those people come back now this summer and, and making us very, very busy. Um, but then we also created two new teams. One was the prone team. Um, so you should have talked a little bit about the um, the benefits of proning. And very early on, there was this feeling of uh, that PT could be doing that. And I, I know, um, I hear your concern that one of the concerns was it should PT be going into the rooms of COVID patients? Do we add value? Um, is it just using PPE? Or is there actually um, a benefit to doing that? Uh, and so we went back and forth in the early days of should we be doing this? Should we not? And we ended up, you know, going right in and we were on the prone team. So it was, you know, around the clock. So we had PTs working overnight. It was um, sort of a pager system to come and help somebody turn. And uh, it, it was wild as PTs. We've never worked beyond the evening and to have to stay overnight was, was very interesting. Um, and then there was a whole other group of people that were reassigned to be sort of nursing assistants, to help on the floors, to be a runner, to do blood sugars and things that we were never doing um, even as acute care therapists. Um, I want to highlight in this next couple slides two studies out of um, our hospital organization um, globally. Uh, this one was out of Brigham and Women's and um, they're talking about their own creation of a prone team and uh, something that I think they found was very helpful and I would agree uh, our program at Newton Wellesley mirrored this program as well. Um, they had multidisciplinary teams. They were um, on a pager system to come, come to the room within 30 or 60 minutes and assist with uh, proning intubated patients and, uh, or turning or providing you know, pressure relief. And I think that um, 
you know, initially it, we were kind of there to be the muscle um, and kind of help just do the rolling. But eventually uh, we were really valued as um, important members of the team who, who innately understand uh, positioning and moving with a lot of lines and tubes. That's very much part of what we do all the time. So we were able to anticipate how things would, would land. And then certainly when patients were um, in a prone position, um, it's definitely awkward to be in a hospital bed um, in a prone position. There's a lot of hyperextension um, in the spine, lumbar spine, and even shoulder positioning was often very difficult because their shoulders didn't tolerate um, that position or their neck. And so we were able to provide a good, you know, sort of orthopedic background of, of that doesn't look good. That's not going to be great when they wake up and help to problem solve that positioning. And that's what the team at, at Brigham and Women's found too, is that we became more experts in, in where patients should land and, uh, and how, to, how to keep people safe while they were unconscious, you know, um, totally sedated and being moved um, without their input. So it was very interesting. And also thinking about the fact that um, patients don't have to be sedated to prone. And we're seeing that more and more now where patients can, uh, in the early days, I remember seeing pictures of, of people with, with um, pulse ox in the 70s and um, supine on a gurney in an emergency room on their cell phones, um, texting away. So it, it, it is possible. And I will tell you anecdotally now, you know, we are using that. Um, we don't know what the, the dosage is, but we do have um, a couple of patients with active COVID right now, and they are being asked to prone for 30 to 60 minutes at a time and if they can tolerate it. And some people said they couldn't tolerate it and uh, they would send us in to help get them with many pill pillows so that we could try to make it comfortable. It is a treatment essentially. So, um, you know, can you tolerate it for 30 minutes? It could, it could be very helpful. So I think people are now trusting, trusting that and, uh, and we're, we're better at making it happen, I would say. Another really important study, maybe the most important that we, we got uh, recently out of our hospital system published in JAMA was um, they early on the doctors from MGH and the Brigham figured out that they needed to track what happened when we started masking people. And so early in the pandemic, we, the staff, at the hospital was required to wear a mask at all times. And uh, that sort of trickled down to um, patients needing to wear masks um, in sort of certainly in the hallways, but then they started saying, even in your room, if anybody else is in your room, you need to be masked at all times so that you were never face to face with a, a patient who was, um, who was unmasked and that could be a, an exposure. And so we did in the early times, we did have exposures where patients were unmasked and their, the testing wasn't as reliable and there were, there were exposures. But what they did was they looked at, um, they looked at this period um, really at around the peak um, or sort of pre-peak and they had 9,800 healthcare workers tested and those were ones that were symptomatic. So um, initially 14.65% of people were testing positive and then eventually they went to, it went down to 11.46. So it might not seem like a lot in, in practice, but that's a good percentage drop um, of the overall um, healthcare workers who were testing positive, which is so important because, you know, we had, we had a concern that huge departments were going to get um, taken out by COVID and that once one person got it, the whole department would be taken out. And what I want to sort of relay to the, the, I relay this to anyone who will listen, especially as we try to bring kids back to school is that when we all wear our masks, we are not getting taken out by COVID. So, um, in our hospital system, in my hospital alone, we never had a single ICU nurse or doctor um, or healthcare worker test positive for COVID, also in the emergency room. So those are the people that are taking care of the highest risk patients um, and right up in, in, in the room all the time, some of those nurses in the ICU um, never left the room for their whole shift. They would call out to the room uh, saying they needed a medication or uh, some equipment, but they never left the room um, because they were so intensive. And, and it was a real testament to the PPE and the amount of um, PPE that we were given. And I think um, it made us feel very safe. And we still feel very safe that if we use the PPE the way that it was intended, we will stay safe, even being face to face. Um, I remember in those early days, helping to roll somebody or helping somebody in the ICU and being six inches from somebody's face and saying, what am I doing? You know, what, 
this this seems scary. I am actually scared at this moment. But coming through the end of it, um, it, it really has been very safe for all of us. And, and, and we work in a great hospital system that does care and provide all of the PPE. But um, it certainly is what I would say is as long as you have your masks, um, you should be OK. And I will say that we were using N95 masks. Um, that is, is a necessity. We had an N95. We had goggles on and also a face shield. Um, so all of that in the, the gown and gloves, obviously. But with that combination, we were all really quite safe. So in, in the end, at my hospital, only 200 people ended up testing positive for COVID since basically the start. So I thought that was pretty good. And I, I don't know of a single department that was um, impacted so heavily that they were unable to function. Um, there were, it's kind of a sporadic here and there uh, picture. And I don't, I don't actually know of anybody that was, you know, like even three people within a group. It's, it wasn't like that at all. It was just random here and there. And so you just never know. I wanted to um, look a little bit at um, why the masking is important. And um, you may or may not use this type of device. This is like a high flow nasal cannula or high flow nasal insufflation. It's like a high, you know, these are, we're talking about high um, oxygen needs. These are 50 liters, 40 liters, 60 liters of oxygen with some force behind them. So in, we initially thought this was a very dangerous um, application for COVID patients because it um, can aerosolize droplets into the air. And we were always worried to go into a room with somebody on high flow because the feeling initially was that this was just blowing COVID around the room and just simply by walking in, you were getting covered with COVID particles and that the risk of transmission of touching your face mask and then coming out was gonna be so, so high. Um, but then we thought, well, let's just put a mask on the patient. And um, early on, uh, you know, MGH was doing some research on this and said, just, just put a mask over patients on high flow and that will help contain the particles at least. Um, and, and initially they thought that we should just intubate everybody who was in respiratory distress uh, because we don't want this system in place where there's particles flying all over the room. And so they rushed, kind of, probably rushed to, to intubate a lot of people that pretend, perhaps didn't need it. And I will say now that we are seeing patients coming in who are just kind of hanging out on this type of a device for, for longer and we're not intubating them. And, and that is gonna be a, a positive change. And, this is a, um, a slide that I did get from the manufacturer of, of one of these devices called Vapotherm. And it shows um, the red particles um, being expelled in the second picture would be an unmasked person on, on um, high flow, a high flow type device. So there's, there's this spray, um, almost a dragon-like spray coming out. And that would be anywhere. So if you were giving any patient care in that vicinity, you were definitely exposed to these droplets. Now, if you had the right PPE on, you would be protected, but still it seems like an unnecessary um, spray of, of um, COVID particles. So the first picture is if you just put a mask on them. So it, it was as easy as that. I mean, certainly these patients have difficulty breathing, but they didn't seem to mind putting a mask on, even if it's just for those few minutes that somebody was right in their face doing some kind of patient care. So this is, this is essentially why we think about masking as being really important. We also, in, in the COVID era, for my hospital, um, had a huge percentage of people that ended on going on to tracheostomy. And that is a, 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 a lot for, for people to handle um, in terms of when you think about COVID, because now they've essentially had this hole you know, in the neck and there's sputum potentially coming out or droplets. And again, that becomes just a, you know, a place where COVID can exit forcefully and um, really cause exposure. So in the same way that we did two things, if they were on the picture on the left of the gentleman who has just an open trach, not uncapped, and that would be what we call a trach collar, um, and that would just be loosely there, you could still cough and expel particles that we could see and then ones that we could not see. So what we would do is put that surgical mask type thing, just like tie it around the neck um, and just to block a little bit of that force coming out um, so that you could stand in front of them and not feel like you were just gonna get um, sprayed with, with the COVID particles. So that was a low tech way to, to sort of manage that situation if we needed to. Um, the other one was the picture on the right, which is a more contained trach system, which would be like a T piece. We would call that a T piece. 
Um, it wasn't didn't mean they were on the vent. It just meant that they were on a humidified air of some sort. And so you, there is a way for them to suction without having to take um, to keep it kind of a closed system. There was a um, there's a valve on there that keeps the expelled air from uh, filters the expelled air and um, it was a little bit trickier to work with in a PT perspective because it was more like being on the ventilator where it would be tight to the neck and it would pop off and things like that. But um, for the staff in general, it was a safer system, at least theoretically, to keep the COVID um, aerosolization down. So that, that was definitely something different that we did. Okay, so let's get into Evaluation, and this is, I would call this, you know, sort of thinking about ICU um, level evaluation. And I would wanna say that um, it, it's, it's PT, it's what we normally do, but there's, it's more complex at times. There, because of the, um, what we talked about at the hypercoagulable state and the level of blood clots in the system, you were getting um, a lot of different uh, areas involved and so when you think about a systems review in a PT world, you have to think about all of the domains and you may have you know, impairments in all of the domains at the same time, which, which is what makes it complicated. Uh, we did see a fair amount of integumentary issues with proning. There was some issues with, you know, it's almost impossible not to get some, but there was some skin breakdown even over the face at times. If you had anything um, going on, you could have, um, not, we didn't have huge issues with, with skin, but some little things to consider. Um, and even if, even if it was, you know, excoriation somewhere from diarrhea, there was a lot to worry about. We also had obvious cardiopulmonary um, issues with uh, cardiac involvement, if there was. Um, obviously pulmonary involvement, that's why we're here. The musculoskeletal part was largely the um, immobility and sort of an ICU acquired weakness. And then there was neurological. And so there were numerous, numerous, numerous people who had strokes during their COVID, the, you know, while intubated and they, we didn't know because they were so sedated and they woke up and then we thought, uh oh, they may have had a stroke because we're seeing some focal neurological deficits. So that you have to think about all of the domains um, at all times. So I wanted to think about um, what was different and in, in terms of like, when do we know somebody's ready uh, to start PT in an ICU setting? And normally uh, we would try to get somebody on the ventilator moving if they've been ventilated for two days, but because of the high levels of sedation, we really did not have luck getting patients up and moving on the ventilator. Uh, and I got some perspectives from some other colleagues around the country and realizing that there were, there were definitely some things that we saw that were similar. Meaning um, one of the things that we tried not to do was see somebody who was very, who had just been um, admitted to the hospital, whether they were in the ICU or in the medical ward, because there was a high propensity for patients just to desaturate heavily and never quite recover. And so we wanted them to at least be getting up with the nurse um, and see if they could tolerate getting from the bed to chair without dropping into the seventies. And if they, if they could do that, um, and if they kind of had a steady oxygen requirement over the past 12 hours, then we thought it was time to start pushing them. Um, but, you know, there was that refractory hypoxemia, right, where you just couldn't, um, it wasn't like you could just breathe, take a few deep breaths, and you could get that oxygen level back up. We had to really wait, and or sometimes it was escalating oxygen requirements. And then on top of that, we had to worry about um, what if there were four of us on the floor and we were all working with patients and they all tanked at the same time. And then we had four patients that needed to be intubated all at the same time. So there were these logistical issues that, um, you know, came up that we had to consider. And there were definitely times when not PT related, but patients would get up to the commode and suddenly they needed to be intubated and you had multiple people at the same time. And that is so abnormal. I mean, in, in a, especially in a community hospital where you have multiple people getting intubated at the same time. So there were, that intensity was a lot different than what we would normally see. Uh, and I, so I got these, some, some people uh, feel like you can't get somebody up on, um, obviously they have to be on pressure support. That's a lot easier. Um, because they're breathing on their own, uh, but just a little supported. And in terms of those high flow devices, they 
like 40 liters sounds like a lot, but they do go up to like usually 60. So somebody on 40 would be on the lower end of need for high flow. So that could be a good time to, to start, you know, pushing somebody to move. Um, and then when we talk about vent settings, uh, we usually would see somebody who, you know, you want them to be on maybe an FiO2 of 60, um, something like that. But we saw patients, you know, higher, much higher, you know, 70, 80, 90, like very high vent settings, very high PEEP that was, um, you know, usually we like it less than 10, but these people, I've had people in 18 in this setting and it was incredible. And so I think people liberalized, if they were able to get patients comfortable on the vent, they would liberalize when they would talk, um, that they, when they would talk about instituting, you know, a PT program and trying to get out of bed. So talking about what things we would work on, um, I'm going to go through a case study next. So I'll kind of go through some of the basics of like what I saw during um, a particularly long case that I worked with. Um, but these are the things that are sort of what recommended for um, in the COVID world. Uh, functional mobility, in my mind, that's always the, the core of my practice. Uh, what, but we did use a little bit of um, body weight support during this time as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. We definitely did prone, um, prone position and guidance. That was a thing in the early time, just to make sure we're not getting, we didn't have any brachial plexus injuries, but that did happen um, in many, many hospitals. We did a lot of therapeutic exercise when tolerated. A lot of patients were very confused and would not, uh, would not follow our therapeutic exercise. So we had to default to just basic rote mobility as a way of engaging muscles. Um, we did a lot of delirium prevention, which is a hallmark of ICU care to begin with. Um, reorientation, scheduling, uh, familiar um, things. But as you know, or, that we didn't have visitors in the hospitals for months um, during the COVID surge. And we're really realizing the, um, the deficits that that causes. If you can imagine being on a ventilator um, in one room for weeks at a time, um, in and out of sedation, um, can't breathe, and then you see nobody that you know for months at a time. It's an in incredible um, disillusioned time and it's terrifying. So we really usually rely on families to come in and provide reassurance and reorientation. Um, and it's hard not to feel that you're locked in a shipping container and being tortured when you don't see anybody you know, you don't understand what's going on and you feel terrible. So that's sort of the hallmark of, of what, what brings on sort of a post ICU syndrome, but more on that later. We also obviously did balance exercises, neuromuscular re-education whenever that was um, important, but the high prevalence of stroke did give us a lot of reason to need to work on that. Um, the things that you didn't do, this was not a, a heavily um, sputum producing uh, disease. So we didn't, airway clearance was not something that we were doing. Um, also, you're not trying not to expel um, COVID droplets everywhere. So, and this was not usually needed. So it was just not something, but if there was, so if you had a superimposed pneumonia over um, an ARDS picture, then you could, you know, the thought was like, well, let's give them something that they can do on their own. And that would be, uh, if you've seen like a flutter type device, which is kind of like an inhaler and that they could do on their own. So there was some thought that if you could give them something that you could direct from outside the room, like you could even call into the room and say, all right, pick up your flutter, I'm outside the door, all right, use this, and then keep the door shut, then you could also reduce the PPE and the exposure potentially. Um, so there was a lot of, of calling into the room, and we still use, I, in, in, our, in, in PT we don't always, but if I had to do in a COVID room um, some education, I could call the room, and I have done that as well. And so using that. We didn't have like a heavy iPad system for, you know, in the room and out of the room, but I think in another surge that could be a thing to do. Um, in my mind, mobility was always best. That was always, these are hot patients with a lot of deficits and they're not probably regularly getting mobilized by nursing. So we need to come in and give our expertise and help them get moving. And also I always think, you know, the biggest thing is inducing hope, right? We're trying to get patients to feel hopeful that they can get better. And what's more hopeful than standing or walking a few steps or getting out to the chair under their own power? It's, it's immense. So that's one of the, one of the big reasons I um, love PT in the ICU. 
So this is what we were trying to, we always try to avoid this post ICU syndrome in uh, hospitalized patients and, and pretty much our whole you know, treatment scheme is to avoid this kind of thing. But COVID created you know, this whole army of patients with post ICU syndrome and it's, it's bad. And we're just beginning to see the, um, the issues that are coming up about this. So we think about, I'm gonna look at the patient arm of this, um, this slide, which is the issues that come up after you leave the ICU. So you may have survived, but surviving is relative when you think about these things coming up. So mental health issues with anxiety, PTSD, depression, uh, cognitive impairment, um, physical impairment. We know that patients have difficulty moving, but what is sometimes not understood by the greater community is the cognitive impairments that follow. And you may be um, a 50 year old um, accountant and survive the ICU, but suddenly you realize that you can't go back to work because you don't have the executive function skills to be able to do complex calculations, uh, organizing your day, um, using a calendar, all different things, memory, attention that you can't do. So being in the ICU is devastating in any case, never mind if you were in a pandemic with, um, you know, in, an, in the ICU for over a month. Um, and so obviously this all creates sort of a decreased quality of life. And um, big academic centers do have post ICU clinics to help it with a multidisciplinary approach to uh, helping these patients recover to the best of their abilities. But after, um, from a PT perspective, it was definitely recognized that we would have, um, again, this army of patients needing help. And so it, in, within our hospital systems, we, they created some post ICU PT, OT, um, speech therapy, physiatry, uh, and psychiatry um, in all in one clinic to help support the patients as they went home. And, I think a lot of people, their families wouldn't even have known that they need to be really careful and, and observant of cognitive impairment. That is a big deal. And we saw that a ton. Um, so these clinics I think are helpful, but also the, the PT part of it as well is very exciting. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about somebody that I saw for, he was in the hospital for uh, three months and somebody that I worked with every day for about two of those months. And kind of this is, he encapsulates everything that um, was prevalent of the patients that really were severely impacted by COVID. So he spent, um, you know, uh, we think about his, his past medical history that was very common that you'd have somebody with type two diabetes, hypertension, a little bit overweight, not, not terrible, um, but a young guy, right? A young working guy um, who he was Spanish speaking, which is a, is a thing um, because I think that that definitely limited um, at times his ability to overcome his delirium because you, he, he didn't necessarily understand what was being asked of him at times. And in a moment where he was um, having difficulty, it was hard to get the interpreter ready on the phone so that he could, we could calm him with um, in that exact moment. It always took a little bit of time. So. Anyhow, he spent five weeks on a ventilator, which is huge. We, we usually see people two weeks max, if that, and then they convert to tracheostomy, but they, they attempted to keep, um, to, they attempted to get him over the hump for a while and then finally said, okay, he's going to need to go to tracheostomy, which he did. Um, so if you look at, this is, this is just in the ICU. He was there for over a, a month, five weeks, six weeks. He had everything, everything that you could imagine. He had um, multiple blood clots in his legs. He had one in his arm, his neck. Um, and from that, he developed multiple embolic CVAs. So bi bihemispheric everywhere, small, but um, everywhere. And he was on dialysis at one point. So he had complete renal failure. He, we talked about his delirium was, um, extensive. He did have hyperactive delirium. He was agitated. So he required extensive sedatives. And when you think about giving somebody sedatives for five weeks, we essentially created an addiction to those, those things. And so we had to then wean him off of the sedatives that we had to give him to um, combat his delirium on the vent. So we had a legion of people as well in the hospital that were on phenobarb tapers for um, 
for weaning from benzos, from whatever sedatives they were giving them um, for another you know, week after that, just to get them over what we had to do to save them at the beginning. So protracted cases for sure. Um, you don't have to get into too much of this, but he had a lot of difficulty with his trach. So he had to have it revised, 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 eventually having to get more of a custom trach. Um, but it delayed his ability to go on to the next phases of recovery, like capping and, um, and decannulation because we were, he, he, the one that he had was causing occlusion and he had to keep getting it uh, changed. And then kind of as a parting gift from the ICU, then he ended up with bacteremia, like the minute he was about ready to leave. It just, the hits kept coming for this guy, um, but really a testament to how well he was able to endure. And, and I think that's a, a lasting um, trademark of, of a lot of patients who had severe COVID is that if you can endure, you can make it. Um, it's just gonna take some time. So I'll take you back to the um, first time I, I met him. He was on the vent um, with trach, mechanical ventilation, pressure support. You look at those vital signs, ooh, it was a lot. Um, but he was so, this was, he had sort of a moment of, of awake and I wouldn't call it lucid, but he was following some commands. And so we felt like this was the time. And so this was a you know, multidisciplinary decision to go ahead and um, not be worried by these vitals right now. And one thing I'll note is sort of his, um, his oxygenation by this point was not the problem. He was sort of recovering from not so much the COVID but this, the sequelae of the COVID. And so his um, oxygenation was fine. We never actually had to worry extensively about his oxygenation. But that's, so, and that's kind of true for most patients that we saw. If you got over that sort of few weeks, month, that, that it wasn't that they were having these huge G saturations. It was more about um, it was more about the other things that were going on. So we sat him up on the edge of the bed. Um, he wasn't following exactly, but he was not fighting. Um, he was essentially total assist. He was like mostly flaccid. We did see some trace movements in one of his arms, um, and he had a lot of upper extremity edema, and that was limiting. His arms were so heavy, just hanging at his side. And once we sat him up, we said, oh, he appears to have maybe like a little left hemiplegia. So it was our first window into something neurological could have happened. And we wouldn't have been able to do that because he wouldn't follow commands. He wouldn't necessarily do a neuro eval, a traditional neuro eval with the doctors or the nurses. Um, but once we saw him in function, we were able to see that this was potentially a problem. So, so I, I feel that we had a big role in sort of you know, guiding his care at that point. Um, and trying to see what that neuro exam was like. I felt like we had the best grasp of his neuro exam because the, we could only see it in function. You could not get it out of him if he was laying in the bed. And so we sat up for about five or seven minutes um, and that was the beginning, exciting. Uh, we continued um, limited very much so by his um, hyperactive delirium. And for the, the probably the first four weeks I met him, he never spoke. He never tried to mouth words. He never tried to um, interact really or communicate his needs, um, even in Spanish. I, early in the case, we brought in um, a native Spanish speaking PT who assisted me in um, communicating with him so that there was no question. We didn't have to wait for an interpreter to get on the line. We were ready and he still didn't necessarily communicate which was difficult. Um, but we, we continued, we, we did all, it was all function because he just would not do a therapeutic ex exercise ever. Um, he couldn't, he couldn't attend to it. He um, couldn't follow the directions, but if you put, you know, if we stood him up a few times, he would, he would participate in that. And um, little by little, literally second by second, he was improving um, with his standing tolerance and function. And um, we did use something that we haven't used uh I've never used it in acute care, but we had to pull out all the stops and that was um, using body weight support. And we have in every room, we're so lucky um, in our hospital to have in every single room, a Hoyer lift with a track in it. And so we were able to rig a sort of hammock style um, Hoyer pad into um, like a hammock that he sat on to give him body weight support. So um, I think I have, yeah, I have a slide. So it's kind of like this where it, we didn't use that quite device, but we did use it similar. The top is very much the same as what we would have. And it's on a track that walks all the way around the bed. 
So once we got, um, we got him and other patients up in these body weight support devices, they could walk or stand or transfer to the chair with, with weight bearing. And this was so important for us as PTs and caregivers because so many of these patients were very heavy. And if we had to lift every single day and hold them up in standing until they could do it on their own, it became, um, it became risky. And we were, we were definitely worried about burnout and injury. And so I thought this took a lot of the pressure off. And then we thought we couldn't take Advil. So then we were worried or ibuprofen. So we were worried that um, we would get injured and wouldn't be able to take the meds that would maybe give us COVID, but we were better now. Um, so I thought this was a game changer. Most of the patients anecdotally took two, maybe three sessions in body weight support, and then they were able to stand and at least get to the chair on their own. So it was incredible. It was an incredible um, experience, you know, um, and especially for the patients, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And we felt confident that we could take risks and, and go further or um, take that extra step without worrying about them collapsing on us or things like that. The one limitation was that so many of these patients had sort of GI involvement with a lot of diarrhea. And if you did this every day, you would just go through all of the Hoyer pads in the hospital. So we had to pick and choose who we could use this with um, because we didn't want to ruin every, ho every Hoyer pad we had. And then um, there was no cleaning happening because the, the vendors were all not able to come to the hospital. So little things like that got in the way, but it wasn't terrible. So eventually um, he went, ended up going to the regular hospital um, floor and it was rough. Um, he ended up with four or five days of in restraints, at times four point restraints. There were some, some nurses that were assaulted. It was, it was rough and we felt like we knew him. We had been, he's not, he's a gentle guy. This is not him, but we're seeing the problem with this delirium that he moved to a new room. He suddenly had zero touch point to reality. Um, he again felt like he was in prison and that he was being tortured and they moved him to a new room. They said, you can't leave your room. You can't get out of bed, all these things. And he had this sort of, um, he was so confused as to what was going on. And this is what we would see with a demented patient who might go to a, a rehab and fall into an, another level of delirium that would not, um, would be difficult to come out of. So we, and we early really thought like we're treating him as if he's had a brain injury. We're really going to try to, you know, from a behavioral perspective, um, from a delirium perspective. So we did a lot of um, scheduling. We did with the staff. I mean, this is unheard of in the hospital setting because usually people are here for three days, not three months. So staff in the hospital were not used to thinking about this is a rehab. We are rehabbing this gentleman here um, and bringing him um, through to the end. And oh, by the way, I didn't mention he didn't have insurance. So he couldn't go on to the next level. He couldn't go to rehab um, in, our, in our system. So he was with us um, for the duration. And, but the schedule worked. We got, we got the staff on the schedule for him getting him out of bed, for bringing him to the bathroom. Um, he even got onto showering and things like that that we would, would just not do in an acute care hospital normally. Um, and we would see him every day. Initially, we had to see him together, PT and OT, because he needed so much redirection, so much physical assist. And he was, he was tenuous in terms of his, his, um, his mood, whether he would work with us or not. So I will say that um, after about two months and two weeks, when we were really starting to plan for his discharge, and we were trying to advocate for sort of a free care transfer to an acute care hospital, but then it's almost like he heard us saying that and he willed himself to get better and he just started making progress. And he went from walking with a walker and two person assist to unassisted walking within 10 days. It was incredible. And um, so he was, by the, by the time we were trying to advocate for him going to a rehab, he was started walking laps of the hallway, which was not, um, the rehab did not feel like that he needed to come to them because of that. But we were concerned at that point of his cognitive recovery. I mean, he still was asking the same questions. Where is my cell phone? Where is, I need to pay my rent. And even if we told him over and over that your rent was paid and your cell phone is on your table, he wouldn't remember. He couldn't sequence that. He couldn't say why he was in the hospital. He didn't know why. Um, so he lacked capacity and would had a guardian in the system we needed to have, he needed to have a guardian, but um, literally 10 days, he, he made it to walking independently. And then all of a sudden his cognitive recovery started and he, within that next sort of five, six, seven days, 
he returned capacity and was able to make his own decisions, which allowed him to go home. So um, the thing that I think about with all of the patients who've had COVID is so many of them are so young and these are not the usual patients we would see in the ICU who have chronic medical conditions, are constantly in and out of the hospital, um, are frail to begin with. These are robust, usually robust patients who have um, work and are functional and active. And so when they can get through the complications of, the, of COVID or um, get through the ICU, if they can start to turn the corner, it happens very quickly because they do have an Im Im immense physical reserve. So that's really exciting. Um, that's what made it really exciting to work with. It was hard to predict from our perspective how soon things would get better uh, because they could literally be um, improving in a day or two. It could happen. So there's my guy right there leaving the hospital, no device walking on day 94. So it was a big win for the whole hospital. You can see there was um, people taking pictures um, and there was, they, we would do like a clap out line. So you line the hallways and as they walk down, clap every clap out um, to leave the hospital. He was so overwhelmed. He like couldn't even figure out what to do. It was probably maybe not have been the best, but um, a very healing moment for the hospital, I would say in general. So I thought that was a great slide to end on for him. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate it. And I would take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shweta and Dr. Julie. Uh, there are two questions for you both. Um, Varsha was asking if any 60-year-old patient having previous COPD, then what is the airway clearance technique in the critical care unit that uh, we can use? As in COVID patients, we, there, there are chances of developing ARDS. Hmm. So the, so the COPD patient doesn't, is not, not intubated, not needing, and they have COVID? Yes. Probably. Um, well, I get, again, I think we would go with the non-invasive, you know, trying to do the flutter um, and de default to, if there were any chest PT needs to try, uh, try not to if possible, but you could, I suppose, do it with masking. Okay. I don't know if you have another yeah, question. I would also add like um, any, like as uh, Julie said, Flutter or Acapella PEP devices, all these also help with, because they're positive expiratory pressure devices, they also help with decreasing the work of breathing in COPD. So even, even without COVID, they work better. And so, um, yeah, those, and those are like self, mm, very easy to train. So I would definitely say that those type of devices would work well for this patient. Okay, okay, thank you. I hope that answers your query, Varsha. Then there is one more question that uh, um, Sumanpreet was facing some challenges while treating patient with COVID who was on dialysis also. So are there any tips which you can add for the clinical or uh, treatments or the critical care treatments here? So meaning if somebody's on, and would you say that it was difficult, I wonder with the COVID because of just timing um, and, or I mean with HD and f figuring times out or um, I don't know. I mean, this gentleman that I did the case study on was, he did have he dialysis did have. as well. And eventually he, um, um, we didn't see big complications with that. Um, that didn't seem to be, he had so many other things going on, but that didn't seem to be a, a barrier at all. If, you know, the one barrier I always see with dialysis is that there are often full days that, that he's unavailable or patients are unavailable because they are wiped out afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, we do try to fit in it before dialysis if possible, or, you know, whatever dosed exercise or mobility can happen afterwards. And if it is a true day where there is nothing to do, then there's nothing we can do. Um, we just have to move on. And sometimes the recovery is more protracted in those scenarios. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Sure. So we had only these two questions. Thank you, Dr. Shweta and Dr. Julie, Julie for this wonderful session. I guess we got answers to a lot of questions here. And uh, thank you so much. We, we just hope to learn from you both more and more. Thank you thank for having you. me.
so i'm just ending the meeting okay yeah, yeah.